and we're speaking on this subject, the millennium. What is the millennium? Where is the millennium? When is the millennium? Who is in the millennium? Why is the millennium? And how is the millennium? And if you can think of anything else, we'll try to include that this afternoon in our subject. We have come, as we indicated last night, to Isaiah, the first of the prophets. These were men that God raised up in a time of declension and decline when both the priesthood and the king had failed. Both the temple and the palace and the throne had failed. And God raised up these men, specialists, as prophets, that they might speak God's word to the people. They primarily spoke for God. It was only secondarily that they spoke concerning the future. And yet a great deal of what they said was future when it was given. But a great deal of what they gave when they gave it was future. Where we stand today in history, we can look back and see that it's been fulfilled. Since it's been fulfilled literally, we have reason to believe that God will continue along the same pattern and will fulfill that which is yet future. Now, I think it might be well for you this afternoon with us to look at the outline of the prophecy of Isaiah, the first section of it, which has to do with judgment, and the last section of it has to do with grace, the grace of God. Here it's the government of God. The last section is salvation, and here you have the revelation of the sovereign on the throne. In the last section, you have the revelation of the Savior on the cross. Now, this includes the first 35 chapters, if you please. Now, we have here the solemn call to the universe to come into the courtroom to hear God's charge against the nation, chapter 1. Then chapter 2, a preview of the future for Judah and Jerusalem. We'll see that today. A present view of Judah and Jerusalem. We mentioned that last night, chapter 3, and another preview of the future, chapter 4. Now, if you will notice, in all of these, threaded in with the judgment, God always points out what he's going to do in the future, and the future is extremely bright. It didn't make any difference how dark the night was. In fact, the darker the night, the brighter was the future that the prophet uh, pointed to. For instance, Isaiah is in the time when it's getting dim. It's merely gray. He sees the future, and it's bright. But when you come to Jeremiah, it's darker, but the future is brighter. Then you come to Ezekiel, and it's absolute midnight. It's black. But the future is bright. And so you have here in Isaiah threaded in, or I should say in the fabric here, you have with the dark colors, you have the bright threads that are woven in. And it's the bright threads we're talking about today. The parable of the vineyard and the woes predicted on Israel. This is a great section on judgment. Then we had this morning Isaiah's personal call and commission as prophet. Then you have the predictions of local and far-off events, 7 through 10. The hope of the future is in the coming of a child. Unto us a child is born, and the hope is to be in that child, by the way. Then you have in chapters 11 through 12 the millennial kingdom. Then you have the burdens on surrounding nations, and we dealt with that last night, how they were literally fulfilled, if you please. Then you have the burden on the land beyond the rivers. There are nine of these. Then you see the kingdom, the process and program by which the throne is established on earth, 24 to 34. And then you have features of the future kingdom, mundane blessings of the kingdom in chapter 35. And that chapter we'll look at today. Now, I wanted to get that before you today. But now I come to... This that we believe is very important to the understanding of our subject, the millennium. Where do you get the word to begin with? It's like several other important words 
that are important and essential today, but they are actually not Bible words. Millennium, as such, does not appear in the Bible. That is, the word does not, but that which means millennium does appear. So the word millennium comes from two Latin words, milli, meaning 1,000, anna, meaning year. And millennium is 1,000 years. That is what the word millennium means. Now, in the Greek, and I checked this again yesterday, it's kilia. Kilia means, in the Greek, 1,000. And sometimes you hear the term used by theologians, and they're always trying to come up with a word that most people don't know what they're talking about. They talk about kiliism. Well, when you talk about kiliism and millennialism, you're talking about the same thing. They both mean 1,000 years, and it has to do with the 1,000-year reign of Christ here upon this earth that is mentioned in the book of Revelation in chapter 20. And chapter 20 is the only place that the thousand years appears. It occurs there six times, however. But the great theme of the thousand years, of the kingdom that's coming on the earth, it is a subject of Scripture. And actually, the millennium is merely one phase of God's eternal kingdom. That is what Dr. Peters has called the theocratic kingdom. And I like that word so much better, that the millennium is just one phase in God's program. Actually, everything that's happened in history, that's happening today, will happen in the future, is all part of God's program in setting up his kingdom here upon this earth, if you please. Now, the millennium is merely one feature or one phase of God's eternal kingdom. It's a special dispensation that is yet future. Now, that kingdom will come to an end, that is, the millennial kingdom, and the eternal kingdom begins. And that is stated clearly in Scripture. Over in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and I'd like to read this because this is very important, Paul gives here the order of events, beginning with the resurrection of Christ. Then he says those that are Christ, will be raised at his coming, each man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then after that, then cometh the end. End of what? The world? No. The Bible does not teach the end of the world. This world that we live on will not come to an end. It's going into eternity. Now, it's to be renovated, made new, but it's going into eternity. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. There does come a time when this 1,000-year reign will be delivered up to God. Even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, all authority, and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Now Christ is coming into this world someday, and he'll come in with great judgment, he will set up the 1,000-year reign here upon this earth. And during that 1,000-year reign, he'll accomplish a purpose as he's accomplishing today. Today, he's calling a people out of this world to himself. During the millennial reign, he's going to bring this earth into under his rule. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. He'll dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That's going to be a time when he's going to rule arbitrarily upon this earth. Now, let me make this very clear to you. We have not yet seen a real dictator rule. You wait till he rules. When he rules on this earth, a bird won't even cheat, a rooster won't crow, and a man won't open his mouth without he gets his permission. That will be a time when his will will be done on this earth. And my friend, even the millennium would be a hell for any man who's in rebellion against God. And there'll be some in rebellion. We're told in Scripture, not in Isaiah, the Scriptures, that rebellion breaks out during the millennium. He judges it immediately because he's going to bring this earth back in under the rule of God. That is God's purpose. Now let me read on here. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, 
For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it's manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, what does that mean? It means simply this, that the Lord Jesus will come to this earth, reign 1,000 years, bring this earth back under the rule of God. When that is accomplished, I take it that he returns back to his place in the Godhead. And this earth then will become what God intended for it to be throughout the eternal ages of the future. Now, that is the picture that the Scripture presents. Now, all the way through the Old Testament, and especially in the prophets, this kingdom, this 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth is set before us. In fact, there is more Scripture, will you hear me? There's more Scripture on this subject than any other subject in the Bible. This kingdom is the subject of more Scripture than anything else. That may surprise you, but that happens to be true. The prophets had more to say on this subject. This was their theme song. They sound like a record that has got stuck. They just keep saying over and over, a kingdom is coming, a king is coming, and there will be great blessing on this earth. Now, the prophets spoke of it and that it was coming. Where you and I are today, it's still future. The conditions predicted have never been fulfilled, and they're not fulfilled yet. They're not even being fulfilled in the Rose Bowl. I don't think you'll have the traffic jam out in Pasadena where I live when the millennium is going on. You can't build a kingdom with all that traffic, my friend. You are not going to have traffic during the millennium like that. Now, the kingdom of God will not be established by man's efforts, man's ability. The church is not building the kingdom today, yet it is geared into a program that will see the coming of the kingdom. But it's not our business today to build a kingdom. We're not in that business. And that's one reason that I'm thankful today that I'm out of the denomination I was raised, and yet I do have an attachment for that denomination. I used to go to meetings, and there are always brethren building the kingdom. And you ought to sing the cheap little chicken coop that we built. And yet we were always talking about we were building the kingdom. My friend, when God's ready to set up his kingdom, he won't need any church. In fact, he's going to remove his true church out of the world before he establishes his kingdom here upon this earth. And that is his plan. That is his program, if you please. Now, the kingdom that we're looking at today, we'll confine what we have to say to what Isaiah had to say on the subject. And believe me, he had a great deal to say about it. Now, this kingdom, I'd have you understand, is the same that when you come to the New Testament, it's called the kingdom of heaven. That was the message John the Baptist began with. He says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. When the Lord Jesus began his ministry, he said the same thing. Now, neither one explained it. And, you know, that seems to indicate to me the only ones that miss this are theologians and seminaries today that don't seem to know what's happening in this world, to tell the truth. But some of the theologians try to make something very obtuse, something esoteric out of the kingdom of heaven. When you ask one of them what the kingdom of heaven is, he bats his eyes, you think he's going off into a trance and that this is something that only he and his little clique know. May I say to you that the common people who heard John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus understood what they were talking about. And the thing they were talking about is just what the Old Testament had been talking about, the millennial kingdom coming on the earth. The kingdom of heaven is just simply this, the rule of the heavens over the world. Over the earth, that's the kingdom of heaven. When heaven rules over this earth on which we live, you will have the kingdom of heaven condition. Now, look, I had to go to seminary to learn that, but that's what all it means. And it's a shame it's to have to spend years in seminary and just make that discovery, that the reign of the heavens over the earth, that's all the kingdom of heaven can possibly mean. You've got to have a Ph.D. or a Ph.D. to miss that one. The common people in Christ, they understood it. 
Theologians today miss that simple thing that the kingdom of heaven is the reign of the heaven over this earth. And that's exactly what they were talking about when they mentioned that, when both John the Baptist and our Lord mentioned it. Now, it will be the time when there is the full manifestation of the glory, the power, and the will of God over this earth. And all agree on this now that it's not in evidence today. You'll not have hospitals. You'll not have graveyards. You'll not have the suffering, broken hearts and lives when he's reigning on this earth. And it's an insult to my Lord today to say that the kingdom of heaven is being built today and is in existence on this earth. When he's reigning, you won't have the tragedy that exists in this world today. Now, we, of course, ask the question, why must we have that? I think God has to vindicate himself. And why is it today that the earth is in the condition? Why isn't God reigning on this earth today? Well, may I say Isaiah tells us how it all began. This is where sin began, and Isaiah deals with this subject. And this afternoon, we can only touch it briefly. Over in the 14th chapter of Isaiah, verse 12, he tells about the fall of God's highest creature, and that this creature led a rebellion against God to set up a kingdom that was opposed to God. And here is the revelation concerning it. It's indeed startling indeed. Verse 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nation? Now Isaiah goes back into the past and looks on into the future concerning this creature that's yet to be judged and brought down. And as he goes back, he looks at this rebellion that he carried out. Now, what was it, this creature, the highest creature God ever created, Lucifer, we know him today as Satan. He has a dozen different names. He's even called a liar and a murderer. Now, what was it he did? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, this is the thing that he did, and it's simple and yet it's complicated. This highest of God's creatures, Ezekiel said he was created perfect in wisdom and beauty, and he hasn't lost that beauty. You saw Satan today, he would not be unattractive, he'd be the most attractive creature that you've ever seen. He makes his ministers today, ministers of life. I do not know why those of us that are gospel preachers today can't be great, big, tall, robust fellows that speak the basso profundo, but we gospel preachers are an unattractive lot. But have you ever noticed Satan's preachers? I heard Judge Rutherford when I was a boy. I want to tell you, he was impressive. I've heard many of these that are the leaders of cults. They are all ministers of life. Satan, if you could see him today, would be the most beautiful creature you've ever seen. God created him that way. Now, what was it he did? This is all he did. He just said, since I'm in this exalted position and I'm next to God, he alone is in my way. And I'm such a high creature, I don't need him anymore. I think I'll just remove him. What I'll do is I will just leave and I'll move over here and I'll start my own little world my own little universe, and I'll have my way. I will exalt my throne above all of the creatures of God, the stars of God. I will put my throne above God's throne. I will exalt myself. I'll put myself in a position of God. Now, 
Satan does not want to be unlike God. He wants to be like God. Now, he fell. Way back in the past, and we're told practically nothing about this in the Bible, something happened to this earth. It happened long before man got here. Have you ever taken the trip over the ridge route? And have you, you know, turned around like that? And you see those great big rocks on the side? I said to a friend of mine who's a geologist, when do you think that that took place? He said, oh, two or three million years ago. And they will tell you out here in Arizona, I have those pictures I showed you the other night, I asked years ago, a friend of mine, again, the geologist with Caltech, he says, you want to see what's on top of the ridge? He went up there and took his foot and he kicked out. And you know what was under that? What made the ridge? A petrified log. I said, my, there must have been a forest here. No, he said, never was a forest here. He says, these floated in here. Floated in there in that desert? Yes. Yeah. I said, when did they float in? He said, they floated in from California. And I said, well, they floated in from California. How long ago was that? He said, about 250, 300,000 years ago. May I say to you, that's before man got here. All of this took place before man got to this earth. What does that mean? A great catastrophe took place on this earth. It apparently is involved with the fall of Lucifer, son of the morning. It's apparently involved in his rebellion. And naturally, when God renovated this earth in the six days of renovation, and that's what you have in Genesis, there's practically no creation there. Man is created, but the rest of it's renovated. And when God put this earth back together again, the devil said, well, I'd like to have my... Uh, apparently, he ruled this at one time, and that's the reason it went down in the crash. He said, I'd like to have at least that back, and I'll go down there and see a man. He came to man with the same temptation that it affected him. You will be as God, knowing good and evil. That's the sin of man right now. That's our problem today. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Those are the three words that tell us what's wrong with all of us. His own way. You and I want our own way. Have you ever noticed the little baby in the crib? You just red in the face and yell so and then holds its breath. You think they're going to die? And you know why he does that? Because he wants you to pick him up. He wants his way. It's born in us that way. We've got a nature that says we want our way. We don't want God's way. And man's in rebellion against God. Now, God says that he's going to establish his kingdom on this earth. And his way was going to prevail someday. And that's what it means. The heaven's going to rule over this world someday. It happened when Satan rebelled. Then man rebelled against God. Now, God's process by which the Lord Jesus will come to the throne, that is the establishing of the kingdom here upon this earth, and the millennial kingdom is part of the great theocratic kingdom of God. Now you're going to find, I did put those two scriptures, I see some take notes, you may want that down. Now I want to just hit some high points here today. The charge is made against those of us who are premillennialists. And have you ever noticed that the difference today in eschatology, that is, the difference in interpretation today of future things, is always around the millennium, not actually around the person of Christ. It's around the millennium. There are postmillennialists. They're dead as dodo birds, however. Two world wars and a worldwide depression and an atomic bomb has put the post millennialists out of business. And there has come up today a new group known as Ah Millennialists. They claim they go way back, but they are pretty new, if you ask me. They were not very much in seminary. When I started in the ministry, the time I got to seminary, they were very much in evidence at that time. And I was taught the Ah Millennial position in seminary. That's the reason I'm a premillennialist, because I studied the amillennial position in seminary. And it's all like one man came up to Dr. Bieber 
and this was years ago, he says, Dr. Bieber, I'm not a post-millennialist, and I'm not a pre-millennialist. And Dr. Bieber looked at him and says, that's preposterous. And that's the all-millennial position. To my judgment, it is the preposterous position. But there are these three today. Now, the all-millennialist makes the charge against those of us that are premillennial that we believe in only a materialistic kingdom with physical blessings that's coming. In fact, Dr. Oswald Alice of Westminster Seminary has said that what we believe in is a worldly kingdom. That is actually not true. And I want to confine our answers today just to Isaiah. Here are some of the things that Isaiah says about the kingdom that is yet to come. And I think probably you'd like to have these scriptures. Here are some of the spiritual blessings of the millennium. Now let's turn to these scriptures, if you don't mind. First, to the second chapter of Isaiah, verse 4. And this is one of those wonderful passages of Scripture. He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That will not be true till the millennium. But the millennium is going to be the first time of world peace on this earth. And until then... You better keep your powder dry. But there will be peace on this earth. And that peace will come when the Prince of Peace rules on this earth. In that day, you can beat your swords into plowshares. That's a great spiritual blessing that is yet in the future. Now just turn over and notice the joy that's to be on this earth during the millennium. In chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion... He that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that's written among the living in Jerusalem. And by the way, holiness is one of the things also that characterizes the millennium. There are holiness movements today and people who say they're holy. Old brother Taylor in Pasadena years ago, he was a retired Methodist preacher, had a little goat tea, used to attend my church out there, and he said, Brother McGee says, I want you to know I'm not a critic. I've been down to the altar at Amy McPherson's place one dozen times, but I'm here to make a comment to you. He says, I want you to know that there's only one thing that the holiness movement lacks. That's holiness. He says, that's all in the world it lacks is holiness. And that today is actually my viewpoint of the holiness movement. Now, my friend, let's not beat around the bush about these things. We're not going to see holiness on this earth till Jesus Christ rules. And believe me, it's going to be holy when he's ruling on this earth. Now, he not only mentions that, but we are also told here that when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof of the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning and the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and a shining of a flame of fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense. And by the way, glory is another one it's mentioned here. And I started out looking for joy, and I haven't even found it here yet, but it's here somewhere, I can assure you. Let me turn to the other passage that we give well, no wonder we didn't find joy. We're looking in the wrong place. Let's turn to the 12th chapter, and we'll find it there. You have to find joy in the right place. Verse 3, chapter 12. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day, and that day in Isaiah and all the prophets is referring to the kingdom, to the millennial kingdom. In that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord. When you say praise the Lord in the church open door, and that day people won't look at you as if something's wrong. You can say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Joy. That's one of the things that will characterize the millennium. Now that does not characterize 
the world today. There's sorrow in this world, and there's heartache and heartbreak. But just think, being on this earth, when it's all joyful and everyone filled with joy, now there's also comfort in this same chapter. Will you notice it? And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Thou that wast angry with me, and thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. In the kingdom, time when God will comfort these people, especially the nation Israel, and I'm not developing the aspect this afternoon of the place that the nation Israel will take, although we will make some mention of it. Now, there is something that I have not mentioned yet that we should. There will be full knowledge in the kingdom. Today we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. And in the kingdom there will be full knowledge. Will you notice chapter 11? There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, and the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, full knowledge in that day. And also, it's going to be a time of instruction, a time when men are going to school. Right now, a great many young people are going away to college, going away to school, trying to learn something. And maybe some of them will, I don't know. But this is a day when a great many people are interested in knowledge. Well, there'll be great knowledge in that day, and there'll be a great deal of instruction. I'm hoping the Lord will let me teach a class, probably the kindergarten class, during the millennium down on this earth. I'd like to come down and teach down here. I enjoy that today, and I think I'll enjoy it more in that day. He says this in chapter 2, and will you notice verses 2 and 3, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow unto it, and many people shall go up and say, Come ye, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. There will be a great hunger and thirst then for God and to want to know about God. We are living in a day when men want to know about missiles and they want to know about electronics. But in that day it will be a great hunger and thirst after God, wanting to know him, wanting to know his word. And I sure am looking forward to that. Every now and then, I think my Thursday night group here represents a group like that. Every now and then, I get in a conference. When I was up at the Campus Crusade conference, that bunch of college kids, I never saw kids as alert as those young people were. And then when I was out in Flagstaff with the Indians this summer, these Indians, might they just hang around you, and they'd let you talk for an hour and a half, and they still wanted you to talk. It's amazing. That was true of these up there. You see little indications of that today. Just think what it'll be in that day, and it'll be wonderful. May I say to you, I think you ought to equip yourself down here for what you're going to do over there. This is really a training place. This is merely a staging area, getting ready to go over on the other side. And one of these days, we're going to move over. So it's a time for that, if you please. Now, I want to mention just two or three passages here that have to do specially with the millennium. And this chapter 2 that I've just read has the special features. Now, let me go over this again and call your attention to what I omitted. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Now, Jerusalem will become the capital of this earth in the kingdom. Just as Babylon is to be the capital of Antichrist, Jerusalem will be the capital on the earth for the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. 
Many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he'll teach us of his ways. You'll have to go there to the university in order to learn. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now God says that specifically. That refers to the kingdom. He shall judge among the nations. He shall rebuke many people. This is a worldwide kingdom. Then's when they'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now that's one of those remarkable passages. Then there is another remarkable passage, and you find that, by the way, in the 11th chapter. And let me just call attention here to several things in this 11th chapter. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root. Now, the one who establishes the kingdom is never the church, never an organization, never a movement. The world won't grow into this. But the one is this one that is mentioned in Scripture as the Messiah who is to come. And that's exactly what John the Baptist meant. When he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he meant it's in your midst. And that is the Greek. The kingdom of heaven is in your midst because the king is here. And you can't have a kingdom without a king. You just can't have a marriage without a bride and a bridegroom. They're just essential. The minute you say, when I say I had a wedding, you know immediately there was a boy and a girl there. There wouldn't have been a wedding if there hadn't have been a boy and a girl there. And you can't have a kingdom without a king. The minute you say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you mean the king is there. It couldn't be otherwise, could it? You have to have a king, and you have to have a kingdom. And the king had come. Now, they rejected him. We're not going into that aspect. We're sticking with Isaiah. But Isaiah is emphasizing the necessity of this one coming in the line of Jesse. Now, he's to come out of the stem of Jesse. Why didn't he mention David? He does later on. For the simple reason that when the Lord Jesus was born, he was a carpenter, not a king. He came out of Jesse. Didn't he come from David? Yes, but David's line has gone down by the time he came. So the fact that he came out of Jesse, he was a farmer from Bethlehem. The Lord Jesus was a carpenter from Nazareth. And that's the way that he was identified when he came. The stem is coming out of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root. Now, the sevenfold spirit, the fullness of the spirit, God gave the spirit to him not by measure. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, fear of the Lord. Now, listen to this. These are the special features, the person, the character, and the physical facts of his kingdom. He shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. The IQ of those in the kingdom is going to be lifted. May I give you one reason this afternoon? When I make the statement, I think we've gone over the hill as a nation. One of the reasons is we do not have any longer an intelligent electorate that's capable of electing the best man. He has to be a politician to appeal to people today. He's got to be able to appear on television. And he may be the biggest rascal in the world, but if he makes a good hit on television, Multitudes of people like sheep will go vote for him. We have no longer a Christian, intelligent electorate. You have to have that if a democracy is to survive, you see. And we've lost that. Now, the thing that will characterize the kingdom, he's going to jack up the IQ of all the people. Won't that be wonderful? There'll be no neurotics. There'll be no dumbbells. There'll be no feeble-minded. There'll be nobody in the class will have to say, Teacher, I didn't get that. Would you go over it again? They get it just like that. Won't that be wonderful? I wouldn't mind having mine stepped up a little. And I've got some fellas here I'd like to see theirs improved also. But now will you notice this? But with righteousness shall he judge the poor. The poor have never had a square deal yet. Have they? The politicians, they talk about all of us before election, and they forget us the day after election. 
He shall judge in righteousness for the poor man. Special interest. The labor unions, they're not for the poor anymore. The capitalists have never been for the poor. Let's face it, friends. The poor man just doesn't have a chance in this world. Thank God for a king that's coming that was judged in righteousness for the poor. I don't know about you, but I'm voting for Jesus. I've already voted for him. He's the one that I want to see rule on this earth. I like his platform. Here it is. With righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. These meek folk. He says the meek are going to inherit it, and they're certainly not doing it today. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now you play that down if you want to, but the word of God doesn't play it down. He'll break them in pieces with a rod of iron, Second Psalm says. Don't play it down. The Word of God's very specific. He intends to put down the wicked. He'll make no treaty with this combine of gangsters in this country. He intends to put them down. No apology to anybody. He doesn't need their vote. He doesn't need their influence. He doesn't need their help. He intends to deal with them. Thank God, my friend, this earth is yet to get a square deal. And it'll never get it till he comes. That's the reason the millennium is quite a wonderful prospect for this earth. Now will you notice, it says, For the meek he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Those are two wonderful things. Now these are spiritual blessings. Now let's look at some physical ones. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Apparently in the Garden of Eden there was no such thing as wild animals and domesticated animals, animals that just would walk right by at him and he named them. And then after the fall certain became wild animals. And they have a nature, a nature that's come because of the fall. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. A fellow came up to Dr. George Gill, the late Dr. George Gill, said to him, Dr. Gill, that's ridiculous. Who ever heard tell of a lion that eats meat eating hay? Dr. Gill, in his inimitable way, said, I'll tell you what I'll do. You make a lion, I'll make him eat hay. If God made the lion and says he's going to eat hay, he'll eat hay, my friend, and like it. It'll be the millennium. And the sucking child shall lay on the hole of the ass, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Nothing that's poisonous on this earth. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Now he's going to talk about this one. Listen to him. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left. This is the nation Israel. There can be no millennium until Israel is back in the land. That's one of the things. There's so many things out of socket today. The devil is in the wrong place today. He goes to and fro in this earth seeking whom he may devour. He has to be in the bottomless pit in the millennium. He's out of place today. Christ is out of place today. He's at God's right hand. He'll be on the throne of David reigning on this earth during the millennium. The church is out of place today. It's in this world the church is to be with him in the new Jerusalem. And Israel is out of place today. Israel is scattered throughout the world, and Israel must be back in the land. There'll be no millennium till everything gets in its place, if you please. Now he'll set his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, Egypt, Pathras, Cush, Elam, Shiner, from Hamath, and the islands of the sea, that includes Los Angeles. He shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. 
gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now that is the millennium that he's talking about that's to be established on this earth. Now one more reference, and it has to do with the physical characteristics, and we are through. It's that wonderful 35th chapter of Isaiah. Now will you listen to this, and we're through. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it in the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord in the excellency of our God. Now the desert will blossom as a rose in the millennium. The curse that's on this earth today will be removed. I thought of that again this summer out in Arizona, and then it's in California too. Let's not blame it all on Arizona. But I drove up from Flagstaff all the way up to this new place they've got named Page at the Glen Canyon Den. Mr. Willard Starr did a picture up there with Warner Brothers. They did up there the Life of Christ. I understand it's made in Moab, Utah. Now, that's a desolate country, friends. You just go for miles and miles. And I said to the folk in the car, I said, you know, it'll be wonderful to make this trip during the millennium. This will be a rose garden. Just think, a mile upon mile of roses. The desert shall blossom as the rose. Now, I think there's a beauty in the desert. It's a desolate, stark, almost an ugly beauty, but it's beautiful. But all that'll be gone, and there'll be the rose garden out there. That'll be the millennium, if you please. That's not all, will you notice? He says something else here. Strengthen ye the weak hands, confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. There'll be no blind in the millennium. And the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The wagon over here won't need to bring the deaf here and translate with his hands to them. There will be no deaf in that day at all. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. I'll be able to sing, then. I want to sing a solo for you, then. It may not be the millennium, but I want to sing, then. The tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Now let me drop down. This is the last verse. And the ransom of the Lord shall return, come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. That is the millennium. That's the hope of this earth. That is not the hope of the church. The church has hoped today is that one of these days we're to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, go to a place that candidly is going to be 10,000 times more wonderful than this earth, the new Jerusalem. But won't this earth be a glorious place in that day during the millennium? I wonder today if you're on the way to the new Jerusalem. Well, somebody says, well, we want to get on the way to the Colosseum. Well, fine, we're going to be out. But are you on the way today to the New Jerusalem and you can go by the Colosseum? I want to go there this afternoon also, but I also want to go to the New Jerusalem. But what glorious things are pictured for this earth in the future. Isaiah set them before us. Shall we pray and shall we stand for this prayer and dismissal? Our gracious, loving Father God, we truly thank Thee for this portion of Thy Scripture, and we've only had a bird's eye this afternoon that reveals the glorious things that are spoken concerning this earth, and that our Savior today is to be the Sovereign on the throne on this earth. We're told we shall reign with Him. We do pray that there may be preparation in our own hearts and minds today. We do pray that we may study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and that the word of God may indeed be engrafted into our hearts and lives. 
We pray thou will give us a hunger and thirst for it, realizing that that will be the great hunger and thirst in that day. We thank thee for these that have come out today for their interest. Now go with us as we leave here, most of us going to the Colosseum. And, oh, God, tonight do a real work in that Colosseum. We recognize that the enemy would like to be active there. He'd like to thwart God's purpose. He'd like to keep people from coming. He'd like to keep them from making a decision. And we do pray that thou will beat back and move back the enemy and that the bared arm of God might be manifest here in Southern California tonight. For we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.